welcome to our presentation on understanding the management of sport climbing gyms. I'm Alexis, I'm joined by my colleague John Luca here, and our teammates Manas and Michelle will join us after four questions. So to introduce the International Sport Climbing Federation, we have a video for you. They discuss some of the disciplines that are covered by the Climbing Federation and disciplines that we will talk about throughout our presentation. So the objectives of our project were to first identify private indoor climbing gyms, to create a snapshot for the Sport Climbing Federation to get an understanding of what was happening at the individual gym level. So first we identified our private gyms, and then once they were identified, we needed to determine what their needs were. And through those needs, we were able to determine a few services that we could propose to the IFSC that would help fill those gaps within their needs. And once we completed those identifications, we were able to compare the developed and developing sectors of the climbing market and also compare on gym size. Okay, thank you, Alexis, for the introduction. So the first step of the methodology uh, was actually to narrow down the scope because um, we couldn't do the, whole, the research on the whole world. Um, so we sat down with the client and we narrowed it down to eight countries, four of which are countries of origin, so namely the United States, Italy, India and France, and other four countries. And these were chosen also based on some criteria, like the fact that they can be divided into developing countries on your left, on the climbing side, and on your right, the more developed one. So the process, as Alexis anticipated, was about finding the, the gyms first in each country. And um, we had to come up with some lists to actually have all the gyms we could find in that country. And the process involved first a research, an individual research online. Then uh, we were actually uh, verifying this list once they were completed through some contacts provided to us by the client to check whether they were realistic, since they were experts in the field, like gym owners or uh, members of national, feder national federations, which could give us advice and give us more context in case someone, something was missing. And we came up with this result, the list. As you can see, the three developed countries float around 100 gyms, the, the, their list, while the developing ones are between 7 and 51. So already in the first step we see that there are less gyms in the developing ones. So once we identified our market, we put together a questionnaire. And we first did that by breaking the gyms down into functional areas, whether that was equipment, events, management, membership, to kind of target specific needs. We then consulted a public gym owner to get any advice um, that were unbiased, so no request that maybe he would want specific to his gym, and give us an idea of what things gyms are looking for. Once we did that, we consulted with our IFSC client to see if those services were feasible and to see if there were any services that, they, that we hadn't come up with that they were looking to implement. We also included some questions on demographics so that we could get a comparison going between gym size, um, number of members, just a variety of comparisons. Once the questionnaire was assembled, we had to distribute it. And we first tried to do this through an introductory phone call to the gyms and create a personal rapport, let them know what purpose the survey served, and sent it via email to either gym owner or gym manager. In many countries where time zone was an issue, we adopted a, uh, a scale for their active Facebook pages with a short introduction as to what purpose it served. And the results of our uh, completed questionnaires. We weren't able to contact everyone, but of uh, the ones we were able to contact, ADA completed the survey, which is about 21% of the gyms that we found in total. And we had the most success in Italy and France, which is where they were able to have better contact via phone. Okay, let's come on to the good part, the findings. Uh, the first thing we found out, if you recall from the video of the different disciplines, is that every, almost every gym was offering the opportunity to boulder as a service to their, to their customer. Uh, while only 70% were actually providing uh, the opportunity to lead climb, and with uh, speed climbing being less popular with only 20%. So to define um, the size of the gym, uh, in climbing you define it based on the climbable surface. So how many square meters of climbable surface there are in the country, in the gym. And um, we can see that 70% of the gyms range between 100 and 1,000 square meters. So that's the most common, common size. 
with uh, still many, uh, almost 30% of very big gyms. Um, and it's important to say that for um, convenience reason, we divided the gyms into two groups. So if they were below 600 square, meter, square meters, we defined them as small gyms. And if they were bigger than that, we defined them as large gyms. And as you can see, there are 55%, so they're equally distributed. So if we put the um, size in relation to the kind of country, so whether it was developing or developed, uh, we can see that 90, almost 90% 90 of, the, um, of the gyms uh, come from the developed countries, the ones that answer the questionnaire. And also if we compare the size, we can see that in the developed countries we have more large gyms than smaller, smaller gyms, and in, uh, while in the um, developing one we have eight, uh, a small one and only a big one. And an interesting fact was uh, the difference between France and Italy. So Italy had more respondents to the questionnaire, but 54% of the um, big gyms, they all came from France. So France is a very uh, big presence in the big gyms, while Italy was more present in the, big, in the smaller one, with 52% uh, of the total uh, small gyms being in Italy. So um, talking about the members, here you can just have a quick overview of the members. They're more or less equally distributed, uh, but what, what we can see is that uh, the bigger part is here, in the, in the lower part. So 40% of them, uh, of the gyms, even if they're small, they have more than 400 members. This is probably because uh, many gyms, even if they're small, they have a, an annual membership and people show up every once in a while. So um, that's why even smaller gyms tend to have uh, big numbers. Once we uh, got to know about the members, we wanted to find out how they were monitored. So if the gyms were providing um, an electronic access control uh, to, to see uh, whether they could uh, benefit from this. Uh, and we, what we realized that overall, 66% of, of the gyms are using this technology-based approach, so to check when uh, people come in and go out, how long they stay for technology. In the large gyms, 82% of them were implementing this method already. And in the smaller gyms, it was, again, equally distributed 50-50. Out of the 34% that did not implement this method, half of them were interested, showed some interest in actually implementing this method. That's because they recognized the benefits it could bring, like the fact that you can allocate your staff better based on when the gym is busier uh, or when it's less busy. Um, the smaller gyms, they focus mainly on the activity of climbing. So people go there to climb, to train, probably <coughs> even uh, um, good athletes that participate in competition. While bigger ones, when we're looking at the service, services they offer, we found out they provide a more complete package that could uh, actually improve the customer experience. Um, in fact, uh, in climbing gyms, as you can see here, um, in small climbing gyms, you go there just to climb, while in bigger ones, you have the opportunity maybe to have a coffee after climbing or while you're waiting uh, for your children to climb or to rent the equipment or even buy it once you're done. There was also an interest on route setting and advice. Um, they, the smaller, or sorry, the clients who were seemed less satisfied were twice as interested their, by their gym owners to welcome advice on how to set routes or just different tips and tricks. While it was still welcomed with at least 50% in the gyms whose clients were pretty satisfied, it was twice as interesting to those who would like to improve their customer service. And also, smaller gyms were still twice as likely to, well, to be interested in a database on potential suppliers of where they could buy their equipment. And it was still a very high interest in service as it was almost 60% in both, size, both sizes of the gyms. Um, and still, they were twice as likely once they kind of have a database of advice on type of equipment. So just getting to know more details about what is best for certain types of climbing or even certain types of climates as climate has an impact on uh, your climbing skills. Okay, then we started looking at how gyms were actually procuring their material, well, how, uh, which suppliers they were using. And what we found out is that the most common way is through a unique and fixed supplier. So always the same, you always call him, you make your order, and that's it. And the second most, most used is through the internet. So comparing the prices and finding the most convenient option and actually seeing every time a different, maybe a different supplier based just on the price of the particular product. 
And uh, what was interesting that even if we asked them how satisfied <coughs> they were with their services, so with the choice of um, the supplier and with the quality of the material, they showed a very high interest in uh, having a potential database of suppliers. So maybe if the federation could provide um, a list with different suppliers that, that they could uh, reach out to, and also on advice for the actual material or, or the products. And even uh, if it's not related to, to the supplier, they were very interested, the service they were mostly interested in was actually having best practices on the management of climbing gyms. When we talk about organizing events, we can say that 84 of the gyms organize events. And for events, we mean competitions. Uh, that it can be related to children, so for fun, or official competition, international competition. So 16% of them do not organize them. Out of the ones that organize them, 41% of them organize them every, once every six months or less often. So it's, they don't organize these events very often. Uh, and what we saw is that uh, smaller gyms would like more advice compared to bigger gyms uh, on the how to organize, properly organize and maximize maybe the revenue and the marketing effect of uh, an event. Um, probably not all the gyms see the benefits of organizing events. Why am I saying this? Because uh, the, the most frequent organizer, uh, they seek more advice on how to organize. And the ones that organize the least, they don't seem interested even if in knowing how to actually improve, improve it. So it means they probably don't see many benefits or don't have the resources, don't want to look into that to, to know how to actually get into this and uh, improve the organization of the events. There was an expressed interest in bringing high profile guest climbers into gyms and they could serve in various capacities. The first was to bring them in for route setting. For, so first they could come in and set a route. That would bring visibility to the gyms as if there was somebody who was very interested in climbing, had a membership at another gym, saw that a pretty well known climber was setting a route, maybe a little bit outside of their normal travel zone, but still feasible, they would likely go there to climb this this route and they could also come in and teach clinics on how to set routes or even just tips and tricks or what would be a best practice in route setting. Another capacity that they could serve in would be to come in for training sessions so for employers but also for members of the gym. Teach them <coughs> more tips and tricks but on how to perfect their climbing skills and how to become slightly better. And also there was an express need for communication. Uh, so many of the gyms in, expressed interest in an IFSC official calendar where gyms could register their events and make it visible across the member gyms within <coughs> the calendar. It would first create more visibility for the gym as it could be seen um, by everybody. And it would also increase communication first between the IFSC and between climbing gyms and also between gym to gym. It could give an opportunity for gyms who, to see another gym who puts on a similar event or competition, and maybe put together a tournament, just increasing that communication. In the last section of our questionnaire, we had a, a part that was um, dedicated to um, open answer questions. So we were asking the um, gyms if they had any advice towards the federal decline, the federation, if there was anything they thought they could improve, they could do that we're not doing currently. And what came out is that there is a huge need for communication, especially between the federation and the gyms, as you can see in the first two quotes. Uh, because people are not aware, sometimes even on the phone, we found out they, they said we never dealt with them, we don't know what they're doing, and it would be interesting to actually see uh, how they can help us, how we can help them, so to actually start communicating and install a relationship. And as the last um, quote shows, there is also some um, problems with the national federation compared to the international federation. So some gyms have to deal with the national federation, <coughs> but knowing the values and um, the concepts that the international federation promotes, they think the national federation is not reflecting those values. So, yeah, in conclusion, uh, as I already said, we think there is a need, which is also the whole purpose of this project, uh, to start communicating with the gyms, to get to know them, to install relationships, so that everybody could benefit from it, and the sport particularly, because the first impact that a person has with the sport, uh, if it's a young child or an adult, most of the times in climbing is inside a climbing gym. And as 
we see it as an opportunity to build relationships. It's also, the services recommended are also an opportunity for long-term benefits for growth of the sport. As climbing was just added to the Tokyo 2020 agenda, it's an opportunity for them to grow the sport before the Olympics, but also in the long term. And we didn't have any questions in particular about money, but there were some comments uh, under each uh, service interest that many people put, I'm interested in this service, but as long as it's free. So as of now, it's a little bit unrealistic to monetize the services, but as we did mention, it's a long-term benefit for growth. So maybe a little bit down the road, there will be an opportunity to monetize. And in closing, we leave you with a quote from one of our survey takers that we feel really captures the essence of what the Climbing Federation is trying to do at this time, and let's climb on.